I'm so glad you're with us here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. One of the best decisions I've ever made is to let you vent about what I've gotten wrong in our weekly Clark Stink segment. Over and over again, we hear from people. It's their favorite thing we do. And I'm ready to hear your beefs also in today's show, or if you're a vegetarian, your vegetables. I don't know. What would you say to that? Oh, no. That's going to generate Clark Stinks now, isn't it? Uh, also in today's show, I need to talk about some new ways for you to save money on your air flights. I keep getting question after question about the sticker shock people are experiencing looking for airfares right now. And I've got some advice that may help. Can't say will help, may help. But without further ado, it is time to hear how stinky I am. All right, you ready for it? I'm ready for it. (laughs) Okay. I just wanted to point out what I think is an error of omission. You answered a question about travel cards. It was a family of four. A husband wanted to get an airline card. You pointed out a lot of bonuses and why you would get the Capital One Venture X card, but you missed probably the biggest advantage of getting either that card or the Chase Sapphire Preferred. If you get an airline card, you have to spend your accumulated miles on that airline. You are locked into Delta or United, for instance. If you get a card that has transferable partners, it totally opens up that window. You can transfer your miles to use on many airlines, depending on availability and what makes the most sense for your travel. I would never advise someone to get a dedicated airline card. It's much too restrictive. Linda. Linda, I appreciate that very much. And you are so on the right path. You know, being tied in to the Delta American or United kind of thing is so restrictive, particularly where they can wake up any day and decide to devalue the the points, which they all have repeatedly done, and the value of being um, a free agent with the Chase Sapphire Reserve or the Capital One Venture X is well stated. The exception, if somebody lives in a hub city for American United or Delta, there's real value for people in that hub having an airline card tie-in with whichever airline is the monster in that market. And so that would be the exception. But somebody who lives not in a hub market, you're completely right. This is not a Clark Stinks. It's a Krista Stinks. What? Yeah, there were actually several people who wrote in about this one. Um, When discussing a caller's Turo experience, Krista asked Clark if he had seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, to which Clark said, where they took the friend's dad's Ferrari or something. And this is when the blasphemy occurred. Krista wrongly corrected him, saying Porsche and not pronouncing it right. But that's for another Clark Stinks. Ha ha. Yes, Porsche. Clark was correct. The car was a Ferrari 250 GT California. My beloved 80s <laughs> movies are being soiled, and I must not stand for it. Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, and many others so who corrected me. So I've never me. seen the movie except little teeny clips, and, I, and I was like, I thought it was a Ferrari. You know, I had a friend. I think the reason I did this is I had a friend growing up, and her dad was obsessed with his Porsches that he worked on all the time. Very similar to the dad in the movie, I have to say. So I think I just did that. Okay, Clark, you don't stink, but sometimes when you're telling people how much they can gift each year, $17,000 per person for 2023, you imply that any gift over that amount will incur gift tax. This is misleading because very few people will ever incur gift tax since the amount that is exempt is many millions of dollars. Well, you should say, did they say how much the exemption? $12,920,000 in 2023. I wish I had that problem. <laughs> I think I've heard you mention it this or once or twice, but not as often as you mention the annual exclusion of gifting. In case you can't tell, I'm an estate planning attorney, Jessica. Jessica, thank you. Okay, so why isn't I just talk about the seventeen grand? And generally don't talk about the enormous exclusion from estate tax is because estate tax has a spring back. And depending on who's in power, when the current estate tax expires, it springs back to an old amount, which is a tiny fraction 
of the 13 million approximately that it is now. I just call it 13 million. But you gave the exact amount, 12,920. So that's why I generally leave that out because you never know what is going to happen with a future Congress. But we do know that you can give that 17 grand, no ifs, ands, or buts. Clark, you stink more than the carton of milk I left in my backpack when I was 11. You recently had a segment about rolling over past employers' 401ks. You failed to mention people who work for the federal government and have a Thrift Savings Plan, or TSP. They should keep their money in that account and roll over the old 401ks into that account. You can keep rolling 401ks into the TSP long after you separate from the federal government. The TSP has the lowest fees of any account out there, even better than your favorite trio, Vanguard, Fidelity, and Schwab. Years ago, my mom made the mistake of rolling over her TSP funds into a high-fee account. Please don't encourage others to do the same. And that didn't have a name on it. All right. I appreciate Anonymous here because I didn't know after you uh, retired from the federal government, you could still actively move money from an old 401k in the TSP. And if that, in fact, is the case, that's brilliant because the TSP is the best retirement account Anybody in America has thrift savings plan for military personnel and civilian federal employees. It is great, 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 great. I don't know why, on the other hand, employees of school systems have the worst retirement plans in America called 403B plans. If you look in the Pictionary, you see a pile of stinky garbage Next to the phrase 403B, TSP, on the other hand, is the best, best, best there is. Clark, you stink like a gas pump overflowed. You talked about how awful gift cards are. I purchase gift cards for for retailers from a Kroger supermarket when they offer four times gas rewards with my Amex Blue Cash Preferred card that gives me 6% cash back. With a $250 gift card purchase, I get a dollar off of a gallon at Shell or Kroger gas stations. So not only 6% cash back, but about 25% off of my gas. Still love listening, Larry. Larry, thank you. And I don't know if the, in Kroger, if the gift cards are on one of those display racks that are not behind a counter. They are. At least I've seen them. They are on a display rack. rack, I mean, that's where this danger has been. And so far, obviously, it's been so good for you, Larry. You haven't had a problem this is not a Kroger specific problem. This any retailer, uh, convenience store, uh, any drug store that has these gift racks out in the open, criminals have figured out how to defeat the security systems. And what they do in short is they take those cards off, they take them out the door, unvalidated, uh, unpurchased. They then get the codes off the back. They put them into uh, these computer programs, these illicit computer programs that are available. They then uh, cover back where those secret codes are, go back in the store, put them back on the shelf. You buy the gift card to give someone as a gift. And what happens is their program is found, that card's been activated. They empty it before your gift recipient can use them. You stink worse than a backed-up toilet after game two of a Twilight doubleheader at Kaminsky Ooh. Park, a.k.a. Sox Park. Ooh. There are other outstanding EVs, such as Subaru Solterra EV and the Hyundai Kona EV. They get outstanding customer reviews and match the range of Tesla. Listening to your podcast, you would think Tesla was the only EV maker. Please stop being such a Tesla fanboy. Love the show, Sean. Sean, I love what's happening, and... Uh, Particularly, uh, Kia and Hyundai are out in front of all other traditional automakers in handling the transition to electric vehicles. And they're going to have a ton of great ones coming in the market. And I apologize if I've had too much of a Tesla focus. Clark stinks like crab guts stew- stewing in a heart garbage can <laughs> for a week. My gosh, I've listened to Clark since before the internet and love his advice, but his complaints of the big monster monster mega banks fall short. At least call it right. Giant Giant monster monster mega mega banks. banks. What you're paying for with mega monsters is local branches everywhere. And sometimes you need that. I had to update my bank account info to buy I bonds and they now require form 5512 with a bank's signature guarantee, not a notary. 
You need a local bank or brokerage branch, and not even all of those will do it. I have small accounts at two of the mega monsters and two local banks, so I can get in-person services like notaries and signature guarantee, and I can shop between them for in-person services, George. George, thank you. And the signature guarantee thing, a lot of people say, huh? Um, I've actually had that problem before because I don't do business with traditional banks, and it is a hassle to get those signature guarantees, and that is a very valid point of an advantage of using a giant monster mega bank. I don't understand your reasoning behind your infatuation for HSA accounts. There are very few people that have eligible HSA health insurance. Most people are better off maximizing their Roth contribution. Healthcare costs are generally not taxable regardless of whether you use money from an HSA account or credit card or cash. Pam. Pam, thank you, Pam. Um, So the HSA, you're right. Most people are not in a position, even if they have an HSA eligible plan, they're not in a position to do what I recommend. It's generally for entrepreneurs who can, who have good cash flow or people that are higher end of the pay scale at an employer that offers an HSA eligible plan because the HSAs have this triple tax benefit where a Roth IRA has a double tax benefit. The HSA health savings account you put money in tax-free, it grows tax-free, and you spend it tax-free. A Roth 401k or a Roth IRA, you put in after-tax dollars that grow tax-free and you spend tax-free. So it's the triple tax benefit of the HSA that makes it potentially superior, but it is for a sliver of Americans, not for a wide slice of the pie. I just listened to the episode with the person who went to Memphis, Tennessee and got a $90 parking ticket for a 10-minute expired meter. One thing I thought you should have mentioned was that they should have complained about it. Write a letter telling about their experience with bad parking in Memphis to several different places, the members of the city council, the mayor's office, the parking department, the convention and visitors bureau or tourism bureau, the local newspapers and TV stations. Also make sure to contact the businesses you went to and others. Go to their Facebook and Twitter pages and let them know that you enjoyed the city and the people and the businesses you went to, but because of the parking fees and hassles that you will not be back. And that's from Richard. Richard, thank you. Um, $90 for the expired meter obviously is crazy. Uh, It was offensive. that, And I talked about how cities should have, they they have the technology now. They know when somebody didn't pay a meter at all, didn't pay for their parking at all, or expired. And I'm a big believer there should be two fine levels for that, a lower fine when you just went past the amount of time you paid for parking. It's a gotcha to charge the same fine for somebody who didn't pay at all versus somebody who just went past the time. Yes, you're right. If, if the $90 bugs you enough and you have no other way to do it, you do guerrilla marketing, complain on social media, you write key officials, and visitors, Convention Visitors Bureau, great place to complain to. And you may bring about change. You may do something that gets you back your $90. Most people aren't going to go to that level of effort. I really value your advice on personal money matters. You stink in promoting football. Football causes many brain injuries and orthopedic injuries. It is brutal and glorifies violence. I'm from Pittsburgh. Terry Bradshaw, Steelers quarterback with four Super Bowl rings, has said that if he had sons, he would not have permitted them to play football. I think high school football is child abuse. Nick. (sighs) Nick, uh, many people who play professional football or did play will not allow their kids to play. And there's a lot to be said for having people at a younger age only play flag football. Uh, Football is not the only sport that is having problems with CTE. CTE can only be properly diagnosed in an autopsy after someone's passed away, but the symptoms are pretty clear. And contact sports, this is an issue. It's something any parent of any child who plays lacrosse, plays soccer, Uh, obviously plays football, any high-contact sport, this is obviously a concern. And I hear you, 
that I do, in fact, love football so much. And I do wonder about my love for it because of the lifelong injuries that players can and do suffer. I'm glad that they're starting to, for the head injuries, like they have such sophisticated helmets now that can even tell you like where injuries are and just they're getting better and better, which is good. So And I saw a high school using an experimental helmet that their state uh, regulatory for high school sports does not allow to be used in competition yet, but it has these rubber um, triangular things spheres all the over the helmet, the helmet yeah. that greatly, in addition to the padding inside, outside, reduces both the impact of being hit by that player and reduces the impact to that player. Okay, Clark, you smell something fierce, recommending that people do not update printer f- firmware is dangerous and plain wrong. While it may seem like a way to fight back against printer ink DRM, it may also open up your audience to cyber attacks. Printer vulnerabilities can be used to potentially gain access to all other devices that are on the same network as the printer. Not updating your printer firmware could also mean your printer does not receive critical bug fixes. While I understand we want to bypass printer ink DRM schemes, not updating updating your network connected devices should never be the recommendation. Leon, and he gave some links to examples of where this has gone wrong for people. Okay, Leon, I appreciate that. And that's an angle that I have not considered um, I actually don't use network on my printer. I plug in an old printer cable mm-hmm. from mine. I may be the only person left in the world who still does that, but I appreciate that, and that's a vulnerability, a factor that I had not considered. I just despise what Hewlett-Packard and other printer companies are doing, uh, hiding behind a law for an entirely different purpose using it as a DRM, digital rights management thing, to prevent you from buying ink where and how you wish. And it is thievery, highway robbery. That's right, Hewlett Packard. I said you're a thief in what you're doing with DRM. And if you ever want to come on the podcast and share why I am wrong and why your practice of selling ink uh, at a price that is beyond imagination. If you want to do that, you are welcome to do so. But what you and your competitors and the printer industry is doing is ethically and morally wrong, wrong, wrong. And so that's my HP stinks <laughs> right here on the Clark Stinks segment. Coming up next, something that has stunk for a lot of people, how much travel costs right now. So we're going to talk about little things you can do to bend that fare. So people are having to pay much higher airfares on average now than they were in the past. Airfares are up like 20%, like period to like period. And the airlines are just smiling because you've got the Boeing problem, you know, where Boeing had the scandal with the MAX aircraft. So deliveries are way behind on that. And then they've had the problems at Boeing with uh, design or manufacturer of the 787. And that has led to extremely delayed deliveries on the 787. And Airbus has had problems delivering the 320s and the 321s because of a problem with the plane, uh, not them, but the engine manufacturer delayed on delivering the engines and on and on and on. And then the extreme pilot shortage right now that the airlines are facing. So airlines that normally, as demand has been rising, would have normally increased the number of flights. They're lacking the planes, they're lacking the pilots. And so What happens with supply and demand? The demand is so strong, the supply of seats not growing to accommodate that like it normally would, and something's got to give, and it's pricing signals. The software the airlines use so sophisticated, and so it just runs the fares up. And it's been shocking lately for last-minute flights how unbelievably expensive they are. And the airlines generally are using a 21-day rule. And you'll see this over and over again, that somebody who buys less than 21 days before departure gets their wallet 
just eaten up, destroyed, blown apart, any term like that you can think of. And so you don't want to wait less than, you may not think last minute is less than three weeks out, but you watch the fairs. You you look at different cities and you see the fair 21 days out, then look at the same market, backing it forward, moving it forward, and look at that same day, same route, 14 days out versus 21, and almost always you'll see that the price is much higher, and then you move within seven days. Oh, my goodness. It's unreal how much it is. So there may be an occasional exception, but almost always that's true. Now, Google, with the research they have available to them, says that uh, 60 days is a real sweet spot. Scott Kai's of what used to be called Scott's Cheap Flights, now called uh, Going, I think is the new name. That one, uh, Scott says 63 days is the absolute right moment based on his research. So you got Google saying 60 days is a really great time. Scott saying 63 days. And uh, that's based on historical averages. Won't always be true but it generally is true. And the day of the week, not that you buy a ticket, but the day of the week you fly, I covered this last month, but I want to mention this briefly again. Early in the week, Monday, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, particularly Tuesday, Wednesday, extremely favorable for the days to travel. And uh, let's say you're doing a weekend getaway. Friday, Sunday, is much more expensive than sun, Saturday afternoon to Monday. So Friday, Sunday, just, I mean, just turn your card over or your cash over to the airline. Let it, Just open it up and let them grab whatever they want. Remember the Jetsons thing where Jane would reach in the wallet and take all the money? That's what the airlines do for Friday, Sunday travel. Just grab that money. So the day you go, ultra important. Um, but you never know, you know, the 63 days from Scott, 60 days from Google, no, uh, no less than 21 days. But how do you know it's really right? Well, Hopper and Google both do predictive things telling you fares are lower than normal, higher than normal, about normal. And Google now is putting its money where its mouth is. Uh, so far with just three airlines, uh, Bloomberg reports, that if you go to google.com slash flight, that they have a new price guarantee feature. I didn't see it. I was just on Google Flights. But supposedly, if you're booking a ticket on Alaska or Hawaiian or on Spirit, any of those three leaves out a big chunk of the airline industry. I, American United and Delta don't hold your breath that they're going to uh, allow Google to do this. But at Google's expense, you buy a ticket on one of these three airlines, Alaska, Spirit, or Hawaiian, and they've told you, green light, you should buy it now. If Google's predictive analysis is wrong and they get no commission from the airlines for you booking through their portal that takes you right to the airline, they will eat the fare difference and give you the money back. So I don't know what's in it for Google, except if they're just trying to get more traffic to come to google.com slash flights. But what a what an amazing thing. If you see a deal on Alaska, Hawaiian, or Spirit, at this point, just those three, and they tell you buy it, and then later that fare goes down, Google automatically is going to say, here's the difference. We messed up. Our predictive analysis was wrong. So they must be really confident, Krista, about their predictive analysis. I know. That they would be willing to do that and at no cost to you pay you that money. I guess if they turn out to be wrong a lot, like with Google where they'll launch a product with much fanfare and then when it goes away, it's like, what, what? I don't know what you're talking about. We never did anything like that, did we? It'll just vanish into the night. All right, well, I have some travel questions. This is from Richard in Florida. My wife and I are going to New Zealand in November. 
We haven't purchased our airline tickets yet. I keep seeing ads for getting business class seats for the price of basic economy. <laughs> are those sites legitimate? They are not. Uh, legitimate, uh, they're not crooks, but they are They are really in a shady category. Generally, what these people are doing is they are usually selling you tickets based on using paying somebody else with frequent flyer miles to say that they're buying travel for you with the points. Or they are doing something else that gets a little iffy. They are what are known in the general lingo consolidator fares, where they have a private deal, supposedly, with an airline to sell unofficial tickets below the official price, or sell tickets below the official price, the published price. And, uh, gosh, the problems people have with both scenarios, not worth the potential. The hazard is too high to be worth the potential benefit. Jerry in Georgia says, I booked two business class tickets on Turkish Airlines to Europe, to Amsterdam, returning from Dubrovnik. I also had intermediate flights on Lufthansa and Aegean and some train tickets. I was forced to cancel the entire trip, and I did not have trip insurance. Lufthansa and Aegean, along with the train system, all issued credits for future travel. However, Turkish Airlines issued a refund of about $195, I'm assuming for taxes and fees, and said that was all we were entitled to. After two phone calls and two emails, I got the same response. That's it. Acted like they did not know what a credit or voucher was for future travel. I booked all the tickets as non-refundable. I assumed Turkish Airlines had the same policy as the major U.S. and European carriers. Evidently not. I researched the European and U.S. agencies, and it appears there is no rule they have to issue a credit or voucher if I cancel. If the airlines cancel the flight, they have to issue a refund. Is there any assistance you can offer? Am I the only person in the U.S. who did not know this? Jerry, it it was actually very recent that uh, this policy started in COVID where airlines would give you, without penalty, credit towards future travel. And it has remained common in the United States except for buying basic economy tickets where you buy it, you can't go, you lose the money. In your case, you were sitting front of the plane business class. And it is uh, stunning that Turkish is not offering you the ability for a credit towards future travel and just says, uh, you didn't go, you lose all the money. That is very, very harsh. You did not use a travel agent, but I would uh, call a travel agent locally and ask if there is a Turkish Airlines rep in your part of the country. You're, you're in Georgia almost certainly, since it's a uh, departure point for Turkish Airlines. They would have an uh, on-the-ground representative in Atlanta who is available to uh, travel agents And just being able to send an email to that individual may be of help to you. Know, though, that policies vary by airline and by kind of ticket, and it's a terrible business practice. It always was for airlines, regardless of circumstance, to say, ha, we don't care what happened to you. You can't go. You lose your money. Oh, we're canceling that flight. All we have to do is give you your money back, and tough, you can't take your trip. It was always an unfair balance, and it's really not a good business practice if, in fact, that is the way Turkish does business. Mr. Lin in California says, Clark, which card is better, the Capital One Venture or Capital One Venture X card? We had both for a while, as the Venture X had a great sign-up bonus, which I used for a free airline ticket for a Christmas vacation to Germany. That I, paid off. I decided to get rid of it before its renewal due to the high yearly fee of $395 and continue to use the Venture card with a $95 fee. We used the Venture card for all of our rooms on a vacation to Germany. We continue to use the Venture Card and just book four nights of hotels for free for our my, for my wife's birthday at the end of the month. We saved about fifteen hundred dollars. Clark, these savings from the rewards went into our brokerage account since we didn't have to use our earned income for those rooms. Is it worth getting the Venture X Card again, or should I continue to use the Venture Card for our adventures and traveling? All right. So uh, these cards. This is the this is the companion card, just like. Chase has the Sapphire 
preferred and the Sapphire Reserve with the big difference in the annual fees. So the Venture X, if you have good charge volume and you like to travel regularly, the Venture X with $395 annual fee is vastly superior with that big annual fee versus the Venture card at 95 Why? Because the Venture X gives you for travel you book through their portal, you get 300 bucks back right away, making the cost of the cards equal. But then there's a whole series of additional travel benefits you get with Venture X you don't get with Venture. One is you have a network of free lounges you can use around the world. So you can be on the cheapest coach ticket and you still have access to a network of lounges. That's just one example of the benefits you get with Venture X over the Venture card. So again, it's, a, it's an issue of how much you travel. It sounds like from what you said, you travel plenty enough to make the 395 card a real benefit to you. The problem, they will not give you a sign-up bonus again since you've already had it. So what I would do is if you applied for the Venture X before, this time have your wife apply for the Venture X if you decide to get it again, and you'll get another bonus. But if you apply for it, no bonus sign-up miles. And John in Colorado says, I heard your comment on Frontier paying employees incentives to charge for carry-ons. Even worse, my son was returning to college after Christmas, and his bag was overweight. Oh. Frontier is at 40 pounds versus the usual 50. The gate agent advised him to just stuff the extra three pounds into his backpack to avoid the, seven, avoid the $75 overweight charge. How nice. When he got to his gate, that same gate agent was out there helping check people on the plane at boarding time. His backpack with the three extra pounds was now found to be oversized, and he was charged $100. The agent that gave him the advice was there, but refused to step in. It seems like the gate crew was ensuring the extra charge for the baggage would occur when they received their incentive. We are a family of six, and as a group, we fly 50 to 70 flights a year. Frontier got their $100, but lost our family as customers. Pretty short-sighted. So the CEO of Frontier was recently interviewed and said that people who try to get bags on that are not of the right size are stealing, that they are thieves. I wish I could read the exact quote. It was shocking the hostility the CEO of Frontier has towards uh, his customers. And, you know, you can have policies and use class and common sense and how you treat people. And there will always be customers that will try to get one over on you. And that's also true. But the quote from the Frontier CEO shows a hostility towards his customers that is just absolutely shocking to me. And Frontier admits that they pay bounties to their employees. They pay them a fee Every time when they rip a customer off with a $100 fee for a backpack they deem is too large, that employee is incentivized with a bonus they receive every time they rip off a customer. You know, you can run a very solid, customer-friendly, deep discounter. But Frontier has taken an attitude that it is hunger games at the gate, and I don't like that at all. Uh, Frontier runs a generally reliable operation, but when you look at federal stats of complaints filed about airlines, look where Frontier is time after time. So I wish that the CEO of Frontier would have an attitude adjustment. Did you find the exact quote? No, I can't find it. I was shocked when I read the quote. So I, I will find, I gave the gist, but it is absolutely mind-blowing what the CEO said. And, you know, I shared something you need to know when you fly Allegiant, Frontier, or Spirit, who all have very, very strict policies of the size of a personal item. And I now always when I fly one of the deep discounters, 
I have a trash bag with me because throwing away my carry-on and some of my items so that they'll fit in the personal sizer is much better than paying the $100 fee. And I only learned this because I saw a woman do this at a Spirit Airlines <laughs> gate when they rejected her, her personal item, said it was too large. She pulled out the <laughs> trash bag, put the items in it that would fit in the sizer, and abandoned the rest of the stuff and went on the flight. And that was my kind of person. Because I do have a, um, a carry-on that I've done in the sizers, a little micro carry-on that fits in the sizer for all of them. But I now always have a trash bag in there if I get rejected by the gate police on the bags. And not literal police, the gate agents. And uh, speaking of spirit, have you seen the video, Krista, of the uh, gate agents in New Orleans that stole somebody's possessions no and they recorded it on social media and were making fun of the passenger and and uh stole his things wow that was very brilliant of them yeah they've all <laughs> well because of the video they've now all been charged right they've been wow. arrested and they're innocent till proven guilty okay but they shot video of themselves stealing this person's possessions seriously wow um, enough about the deep discounters, and I do fly the deep discounters. You just got to know how the game is played, and generally they don't hire thieves. Uh, the funny, oh, I should say one other thing. Spirit says they were contractors. They were mm. not Spirit employees, and many times you're dealing with people who are not actual airline employees on any airline anywhere in the world. They may be wearing something that says the name of the airline, but they are contract workers, not employees they of the airlines. They were cons. They were cons, <laughs> not contractors. Thank you. And that's it for us this week. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share the show with someone you think will benefit from what we have to say or will, in fact, enjoy it. And have a great day. Oh, that'll cost you $100. No, it won't.